Well, it's it's eleven o'clock. I think we'll get started. Others will come into the meeting as as they enter the waiting room. Uh, good morning. My name is Jan Schmitz from the Edmonton Pride Seniors Group. It's March third. Oh my goodness, March. Oh my goodness. And thank you all for attending our weekly Aging with Pride discussion group for the LGBTQ2S plus seniors and their allies. Thank you too to our partners, SAGE and the Pride Center of Edmonton. Before I introduce our speaker, I must acknowledge that we are located on Treaty 6 territory and respect the histories, languages, and cultures of First Nations, Métis, Inuit, and all First Peoples of Canada whose presence continues to enrich our lives. A couple of housekeeping items. I must let you know that this session will be recorded for future use. Um, so if you have an issue with that, please close your video feed. Uh, please respect the speaker by remaining muted during the talk. We will unmute you for the question and the answer period. Be mindful of our time limitations and keep your questions and comments as brief as possible so that everyone can participate. And finally, please respect the confidentiality of personal information. And now, and with great pleasure, I would like to introduce our guest speaker. Lori Winder has been with Ashbourne since June of 2015. Ashbourne is the first seniors residence in Canada to receive affirming status from the United Church of Canada and welcomes individuals from diverse populations. She's highly educated and a gifted speaker. We're really happy to have her here today. Thank you, Laurie. Please proceed. All right. Thank you for that lovely introduction. Um, I don't know if I'm a great speaker, but I'll, I'll give it my best. I'm a casual speaker. So uh, what I'd like to do for you today is sort of talk a little bit about um, how Ashbourne became a more inclusive uh, seniors residence. And then also what, what, we, what we did to change and what we learned through the process. And so if any of you now or in the future are looking for inclusive housing, I'll give you some tips and hints of how to, what to look for and um, what types of questions to ask, because I think that it's important. Um, I'll just let you know, I have been working in not-for-profit for 30 years. I stepped out of it for two years and decided not for me. I've been working with seniors now for nine years. Um, I have a master's in leadership and I'm married with two grown adult daughters. And I, I was trying to look up when I started with Edmonton Pride Seniors Group. And it seems like at about 2017, uh, was my first uh, meeting with Edmonton Pride Seniors Group. And I'll talk a little bit about that because it's all Eric's fault. And uh, right now I'm the executive director at Ashbourne. So we're an independent and assisted living uh, community for older adults. And we're right across from the university emergency um, department. So we're in the Garneau neighborhood, um, which is a, a lovely neighborhood to to walk. It's, it's been kind of quiet around here. All the, a lot of the students aren't back yet, but uh, I do enjoy working here and watching all the stuff on campus. Um, so I guess it, I just want to talk a little bit about the journey of getting Ashbourne to uh, where it's at today. Uh, and it certainly has been a, an evolution, I would say, and, and a timely evolution, but it has been an evolution. Things don't happen overnight. And I find that we're still sort of in transition. So there's two parts to how we ended up is sort of my own personal uh, values and interest in social justice, justice, and also where Ashbourne was when I started with them. So Ashbourne um, was established by the Garner United Church. And, but the sort of the United, Garner United Church has been sitting on this spot for well over 80 years. And so they, they actually um, thought about, oh, in about 1995, they felt like their congregation was slipping away and that they, would, they wanted to leave a legacy for the Garner neighborhood. And so they built Ashbourne, which opened in 2010. Now, the Garner United Church um, in particular, not all churches or United Churches are created equal, but Garner United Church is quite a liberal church with a very inclusive um, congregation and membership that uh, it's been maintained throughout the, the life of the church here. 
And uh, we do have a number of members on the board and also members of Guardian United Church that are from the LGBTQ2S community. And so uh, it's always, it's, it had been a natural fit for me to come here as it linked my social justice um, focus. Now, prior to working with seniors, which I've been doing, am I, how am I doing, Kim? Am I going too fast? Okay, good. All right. Um, prior to that, I worked with people with intellectual disabilities for 25 years plus in a not-for-profit sector and made the, made the leap over to, to seniors. And although you might think those are two very different careers, they are not because I experienced the same level of um, discrimination and bullying and things where people were not able to live authentic lives and felt that they didn't have the same opportunities as others. So that really spoke to me when uh, the board of Ashbourne said, we would like to become affirming. Now, if you're familiar with affirming, it's generally held for churches and United Churches of Canada to go through a process to make sure that they are inclusive. And at the end, you receive a certificate that says you are, you are affirming. And up until the point where Ashbourne had applied, um, it's going back now to 2015, we started the process, or shortly after I got to Ashbourne, no seniors residents, although the United Church had several, had ever asked for affirming status. So they were, it was a head scratch. Really like, hmm, this is weird. So we did go through the process and um, we received our affirming status on May, uh, of 2017, and I'll have a little bit more information about that. And it was important to me and the board that this was made public, and so we did. And along this journey, I want to tell you a little bit about the journey because it involves Eric and Larry. So when I started looking into uh, making sure that Ashburn was more inclusive, I needed some expert help. And I'm not from the LGBTQ community, um, or at least I wasn't at the time, and now I, I'm an ally. Um, I, I felt like I, I couldn't speak um, with any amount of uh, credibility around what, what Ashbourne needed at the time. So I started with the Pride Center, I had Eric, I had Larry, and they came along and Christy, who used to be the executive director of the Pride, were instrumental in helping me understand what kinds of things we needed to do at Ashbourne. And so thank you again for fellas for that. And so they were very gracious with their time and helped us partly with um, understanding, Christy was really understanding with what our environment should look like. And, uh, and the fellas helped us talk to our staff and talk to our residents and, and discuss how important that was going to be um, for us. And so it was really a, a, a learning experience for me and, and uh, from a selfish note, I also gained a new pack of friends, which uh, have been lovely. And I've spent a lot of time with and worked on project. And Eric was the person that said, Lori, you should come on the Edmonton Pride Seniors Group. And so here we are. And, and it has, Edmonton Pride Seniors Group and its members have been a invaluable resource for Ashbourne in terms of understanding your community and making it part of ours. So. Uh, that's again, that's, that's gratitude coming out there. So um, let me see what else I can talk about here. So a little bit about the process is that when we went through that, we realized that, you know, it's okay for the board and the leadership of an organization to decide we're going to go in a direction. And we were pretty clear that we were going to get there, but we needed to make sure that we included the residents, the staff, the families in this process. So they understood and were able to support what we were doing. And so we had a number of, I think Larry, you were one of the first people to come and you talked to families and residents, is that correct? Yes, and, and he, he won them over with his charm and uh, it was a lovely, a lovely session. And Eric also came along uh, when we talked to staff where we brought the staff together and we had an open discussion saying, this is what we intend to do. How do you feel about that? And we, I was anticipating maybe a little pushback, but all we got were sort of reasonable kinds of questions. 
and um, we haven't looked back since then. So after that, we started working on the, the next process. And I'll just, I'm just going to share the screen with you and just show so you don't have to look at my, my mug for too long. Let me just, all right. Oh, you still see my mug. Oh my goodness. <laughs> all right. So I wanted just to share with you that what we found out doing this, and you probably know that not all housing is created equal, that some places um, really just sweep things under the carpet and, and don't come head to head with um, what the issues are in terms of inclusiveness. And so we went on this journey. And so we, what's interesting is, is we already had a, a strong vision statement at the time that uh, really backed, it was a touchstone for the work that we did. We didn't change this. This was already there when we started our process. And uh, so we held that up proudly. Now, there we go. There's a picture you might recognize some politicians because you know, if you, if you get politicians, you get press. And uh, so these are, these are some of our board members. There's various, oh, I know recognize his face there in the blue shirt. And he's always been a big supporter for us. And so we, on May, 2017, we had a big um, celebration. Uh, basically are coming out to say that we were a um, affirming organization that we're welcoming and it was very well received and uh, so that was that was us getting our affirming status now prior to that we had to really beef up and we were talking just before we went online here is that we needed to make sure that our policies and what we said and what we did and what we looked like backed up what we were what we were asking people to do and so it started with really changing up some of our, our our documents and this is an excerpt and you can just read that i won't read it for you that talks about our expectations for residents because we have we have sort of a number of different folks and visitors to the building and also people that live and work here so we we're talking about hundreds of people that potentially cross our threshold and into Ashbourne and we wanted them to know uh, this is who we are. So we have a resident handbook and we want to make sure that people coming in understand who Ashbourne is. You know, for some people we might not be the place for them, but for some people we are. And so we have a real, and for those who don't know Ashbourne, we have a real mix of people. Um, both in our resident population and our staff component. We're very multicultural. We, um, we have an age in place uh, value, which means that we do have people that may, from being very, very independent, um, park in our parkade, off they go in their car, off to curling rink on, on Tuesday morning and, you know, flying here and there and doing all to people that have aged in place and require a little bit more care. And so some of those folks might um, also present unique um, characteristics. For example, someone who has mental health issues or someone who um, is start at the beginning of dementia or has some health issues. So we needed to understand that Ashbourne itself was a community and that we were going to accept People as they are, they are our neighbors. And so we're inclusive of that. And um, that needs to be something that residents coming in understand that that's who we are. Otherwise, you're not gonna be real happy when you get here if you're expecting everybody to look like you, act like you, think like you, because it just doesn't happen at Ashbourne. And so we also had a, a little bit, here's a little bit more. The other thing was to be, it's okay to say we are inclusive for all sorts of um, different communities, but we also needed to back that up with some policies and some uh, pieces in our handbook that, and, it, it, and my apologies if it sounds harsh, and I'm glad to say it is very rarely needed to be used, but we will not tolerate uh, any kind of bullying or harassment and so forth. So uh, if someone reports those things, it's dealt with quickly and swiftly. And if we aren't able to sort of mediate that uh, condition, we are willing to um, let go staff or evict residents that are the, the bully or the people that are, are harassing people. So we, we will go that far. So that just gives 
what we say a little bit of teeth and I hope that doesn't sound too harsh but it, it's really important to us that if we say we are this this kind of place that we we back that up and we don't tolerate um, people being bullied or, or harassed in the building or made fun of or um, that sort of thing. So we, we do that. And so also HR policies. So not only our residents, but also our HR policies and uh, for visitors that come into the, the building. Um, so I'm just going to move this over for a little bit. I'm sorry, I just I don't want you to lose that, but I want to get back to my notes. All right, my notes over there. Are we, what are you looking at just now? Are you still looking at my slides? Okay, good. All right. So that was what um, Eric was talking about in terms of we had a lot of paperwork, we had a lot of stuff to do, but then we also looked at what's our environment. Um, in terms of, do we, do we have the pride flag that is with the Canadian flag and the Alberta flag, the three flags are always together. We have little ones in our lobby. Um, you, if you come to, if you look at our marketing materials, we, um, they usually have a little rainbow on them just so people know that's just the little thing that says that we, we're, we're inclusive, an inclusive organization. Um, so I think, I think that's important as we put things out there that people understand that that's who we are. So when potential residents come for a tour, we, we make sure that we point out and talk about being inclusive. So we'll point out the flag, oh, just so you know, this is who we are. So residents that are visiting understand that, or sort of potential residents that are coming in for a tour understand that that's who we are. Um, so we've got we've got posters or pictures up that says you know everyone belongs. So there's just those visual reminders that that's who we are. And so that's not just for our visitors and potential residents. That's for our staff and our, our current residents. So those little reminders that says, yeah, this is who we are. We have safe space stickers up um, on some of the the offices just so people know if they need to come talk to us that they can. Um, so one of the things is to make sure that Ashbourne walks the talk. So uh, some of the folks on this call today can, we've, we've used our space. So we're, we're very, and, I, and I, again, try not to boast, but I'm very proud of what we do, but we're very generous with our space. So we have opened it up for focus groups. We had a, um, an LGBTQ2S youth group meeting here. We, we just gave them a space. So they had a place, a central place to meet. Um, we've had the Jerry actors, we've had twice before it sort of came to an end before COVID and the year before, we had our own pride booth, a booth at pride. And that was uh, a lot of fun, but we were probably, I think a lot of the people that attended said we were the first seniors residents to actually show up and to the, the pride, uh, parade and the booth. So we went there to sort of hand out information about who we are and, um, that got us a lot of attention. The other thing we've got uh, in Ashbourne, and I would like to thank Alvin and Blair for boosting our, our library. So we made sure that our library had some really good books that were um, maybe of interest or focus on the LGBTQ2S. Um, there, some is fiction, some is nonfiction, but we've really got a, a nice collection up there so that people go in and we had some and then someone actually took them. So <laughs> we have this habit of people boring books and then they don't bring them back. And we have this thing called a book roundup once a year where we have to ask people to bring out all the books that don't belong to them. But anyways, we have quite a few, um, uh, probably about, I would say like about 60 or 70 books now which is quite lovely. Uh, we also make sure that we have uh, movie selections. So we have regular movie nights and some of our mo movie selections are also of interest to our folks. Um, and so we, we do that fairly regularly. And what else we got? Newsletters, our, our bulletin board, we all, or we've usually got, or we do have up the uh, Aging with Pride conversation. So I'll print them off and it goes up on our board. Um, we, we had a regular feature in our newsletter. It was uh, just basically a, a rainbow corner that would put information in there for folks. Um, we have, uh, and that goes out monthly. So that's been 
probably. And I'd like to say that we've been really on top of these things um, in the last few months, but I'd be lying to you. COVID has done some uh, uh, changes to our, our work here. And so our ability to gather and do things together as a group and really work on this has been um, impeded. And so the, our hope is, is that once COVID lets us open up, we can get back to some of this good work with gathering and, and uh, working together. So we also, uh, with the General Hospital, they have a, a, an LGBT group there as well. And they we have a bus, so they'll go on outings with us. So we'll invite people to come along and we'll zip down to the general, pick them up and uh, they'll come with us. Those are just folks that meet there once or twice a week. And uh, yeah, so let's, let's just see. Oh, we don't want to go that far yet, so too far. Sorry, guys, I'll just put that off for a sec, and then I'll put it back on when we are. All right, I'll put that back on when we're ready, just because I'm not quite there yet. Sorry for that. So let me tell you, going through this process, so now, what did I say, 2017, and we actually started around 2000, late 2015. So we're, we're in it, we're in it for close to, that's five, seven years. And so we've learned a lot. Um, and so what I want to tell you what we've learned is that it's, it's never done. It's, it's a process. And we continue to learn it and evolve through this process. I would like to say, okay, okay, we're inclusive, check, done, move on to something else. It, it, it hasn't worked that way. And, and you, there's lots of good reasons why not. One is, is that staff and residents come and go as well as families. So we, we um, the process begins again. So I think it's an easier process for people coming in because we have our, our staff orientation, we have our resident and family orientation, it's in our handbook, those kind of things. I think it's an easier process, but as people come and go, we have to re, uh, for lack of better words, re-educate or reorient people to who Ashbourne actually is in the culture. And so um, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a comment and, and I won't use names, but it just gave me one of those little twigs the other day about, Lori, we need to start paying attention to this again. It's time for a refresh or doing. So one of the family members came to me and said, there was one of our, our housekeepers in their suite. And please don't share this information. Like we said, there's confidentiality in the suite. And we have a, a, a gentleman who has flowered sheets. And this is a fairly new staff person. And she said, well, why do you have flowered sheets? Men don't have flowered sheets. And I was like, well, and his, and the daughter happened to be there and she said, well, because he likes flowered sheets. And so it was that just, it was an offhand comment that she didn't understand. It was probably coming from a, a not, not a malicious place, but it, it just really twigged to me. So this happened within the last week. It really twigged to me that it's time that we, we sort of revisit some things and have conversations. And when I talk about conversations, I talk about gentle conversations, not you must not do that. We'll just, we'll just talk about what that might have meant to the person with the flower sheets. You know, is that, it seems like an innocent comment from that person, but it's, it's, we, that's, that's not her business, right? What kind of sheets and it doesn't make sense. It's very gender specific, which is, we need to talk about that. So what that little story tells you is, is as an organization, you're never done. You're never done. That you always need to be having those open conversations. And so we talked about uh, a lot of our staff, we, we've got a lot of staff that have been here for a long time. We're, we're, we're blessed with very little turnover. And so we thought, you know, it's time to sit down with the staff again and have a conversation. So we're, we've got a, a, an all staff meeting plan for next week and we wanna just have conversations again. And I hope that we've created a culture in which those conversations are comfortable and that they can, uh, if they have questions, Talk, talk to us about them. If they're um, not comfortable, come and see me another time or talk to another person. The other thing we learned is you cannot change people. So I would like to say to you, all of the folks that live, work, or visit Ashbourne are LGBTQ friendly. 
And that probably is not the case. So we switch from being, you must think this way until we've changed our tune a little bit and with more thoughtfulness after we sort of started this whole affirming process, it was more about creating a culture of respect. So, uh, and I'll give you another example of creating a culture of respect is you might have a different opinion about Kenny than I do. But I work here and I have to still treat you with respect, even though I do not agree with what you're saying to me. So in my, you know, my, my naive brain, I was hoping that everybody would just change and, you know, drink the Kool-Aid and be as open to being inclusive as I was and the vast majority of staff, but that is not necessarily the case. Um, I think that it's a very much a minority, but what we've come to learn, and so the same goes for folks with um, mental health issues or the beginnings of dementia, that uh, we may not want to be their best friend as their neighbor, but we are their neighbor and we treat them with respect. And that, that sort of has evolved from uh, which is a, a lovely piece that has come out of our affirming process is that we really need to look at that culture of respect and how do we nurture that? How do we maintain that culture of respect so that it overflows to everybody? And so a lot of that is through conversation with residents and staff and uh, family members. And it's just about, okay, this is an aging in place. So, so like we mentioned before, not everybody's going to look, act, or think like you. But regardless, they deserve your respect as being that's your neighbor. That is someone who is paying your wage to be here. So you, it doesn't matter. You, this is, and look at the person. Everybody has, so I come from an asset-based uh, community development uh, background as well. And so I feel that everybody has gifts. Everybody has um, positive things to add to the world. And so even if someone is at the, you know, in, in a state of dementia where they're wandering at night or making noise or doing something that might, they, they have something to offer the world. And so we need to listen. And so having those conversations quite often with um, people that move in and say, well, so-and-so in this room is this way. And I said, well, that's okay. You know, they, they're, that's your neighbor. We're a community. We're here to take, we're here to take care of each other. And so that's sort of what has made the shift from just being inclusive to actually understanding a culture of respect. So, uh, and again, that's another piece that is something that we really um, have to keep in the front of our mind when we get busy with COVID, when we get, you know, crazy busy worrying about budgets and have we sanitized three times a day because the HS is coming in or whatever? We have to be really clear that that is always there. And, I, and I, I'm happy to say probably for the vast majority of the staff and residents that exists, it's because we will have, if, if, if it's observed that that hasn't happened, then we, we will have a chat saying, what just happened there? You know, how do you think that person feels? So that, that's an ongoing process. Um, we talked a little bit about COVID. And so one of the things that we find too is feeling a little bit disconnected from families right now. Generally families are really part of the, the rhythm of what happens in Ashbourne. So people are coming and going and visiting. So we, hey, Mrs. So-and-so, oh, your dad, I just saw him down at, uh, he was playing whist downstairs or, you know, I hear he likes to sing or that kind of stuff. So we've really feeling quite disconnected because the family members are also part of this equation. They, we have family members from the LGBTQ community as well. So we wanna make sure that when those folks start coming and we just opened up March 1st to allow uh, lots of visitors back in, um, we wanna make sure they feel welcomed as well, that everybody coming in feels welcome. So, all right. So let me just, I'll, I'll quit talking shortly, but I wanna tell you if, Let me just pull my slides back up again. 
Okay, give me a sec here. All right, so I'm going to share the screen. So I wanted to talk a little bit about, I don't know where you guys are at. I am currently, my, my mom is 87 and my, my stepdad is 90. And he, his mobility is really failing. So I'm in the process of looking for uh, supported living. And don't tell my mother I said this, I think Ashbourne is the best, but I don't want her in my workplace every day. <laughs> I, my mom would be down here saying, did you have lunch? And she'd be knocking on my door when I'm on Zoom meetings. And oh, and I'm sure the staff would think that, uh, that uh, they had to treat them differently. So I have not invited them to come and live at Ashbourne, although I think we would fit their, their build really nicely for what they need. And, and our, our staff are phenomenal. But anyways, if so... This is really playing on my mind. So when I was thinking about for this, the topic of this conversation, I thought, you know, what do I need to, what do I need to ask? I can ask all the questions. Do you have a night, a nurse overnight? Do you, how, who makes your meals? Are they made on site? Are they, are they brought in from somewhere else? You know, um, what if they had an emergency? What would happen? You know, how often do you put the rent up? I can ask all those questions, but if from an inclusive um, standpoint, I think that, uh, I will go in with a, a, a different set of eyes as well. So I'll have those daughter, I'll come in with all the daughter questions and then I'll come in with, a, I'm an executive director. I know how things should be run in a senior's resident perspective. And also, is it inclusive? And first and foremost, and, and I've learned this from people coming into Ashbourne, um, what does your gut tell you? Does this feel comfortable to you? Um, are the people, were you welcomed? Do you, the people around there look like they're comfortable, friendly? Do they look safe? Anyways, all those kind of things. I would, I would be looking for that. How do I feel when I walk through the door? How am I greeted? And often people come into Ashbourne and, and say, wow, it's got a really nice feeling. You have a dog in your lobby. So we have a, we have a Miss Daisy Ashbourne, our dog, and she is, uh, greets people and so people are like oh that's really nice there's a dog we are pet friendly so anyways so we have a different we're not the one of those high-end super fancy places but we're, we're quite homey and so we walk into a place is that for you do you want something that looks more like a hotel because some people do or do you want a homey kind of feeling so look at the environment what are the physical indications that it's inclusive is there do you see a rainbow flag anywhere do you see safe space do you see um staff that might be from the LGBT community. We have, we have a number of non-binary or we, so transgender folks that work here as well. So we, it's, do you see things like that? Would the place hire that? Ask about their policies for bullying and harassment and consequences. What, so they're bullied. Do we just go say stop bullying because a bully won't stop bullying just by asking them to do it. They just don't. And so do we do that? Um, you can ask new residents and staff, are their jobs, are, are they, does it include information about respect and inclusion and rights? I think, what did I write there? Ask how new residents and staff are. So, so how are those folks doing? If you get a chance to talk to a resident, how do you like living here? How's the food? Food's really important. Whether or not it's to do with inclusiveness, I'll tell you. And uh, if anybody else on the line lives in a senior's residence, they'll tell you. Food is one of the number one things that makes you love or hate the place you live. Because if you're not cooking and you eat there three times a day, it's got to be good. But also, are the staff friendly? If you walk by, go ask them, can I use your bathroom? Go look. And as you're walking through the hallway to the bathroom, say, see if people will greet you, say hello. Um... Speak to the residents and the staff. Oops, sorry. If there's a library, go look in the library. See if there's inclusive materials. Ask if they have a look at their recreation calendar. Are there uh, recreation things that interest you? And ask them if they, here's the, here's the teller. And you can maybe start off with this one. I'm not sure. Ask them if they have other uh, residents from the LGBTQ community. And if they say no, they're lying. They're lying. And those people are just not being uh 
feeling in a place comfortable they can come around. Chances are there are folks from the community in their building, but if they tell you they're not, they're either in denial or they're lying because they don't want to deal with doing any the work that it takes to make sure that all communities feel comfortable. So that's a big one. And I think Eric and Larry may tell you that in their exploration and trying to do some of their education, they have come across organizations that just say they don't have people there from the LGBTQ community. So I would argue with that. And so straight out, ask them, because if they say no, I turn around and walk right out. Okay, so I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. I just wanted to give you this. Um, you know, you may or may not be ready for more services, but if you are, here's a little, here's a link down here that tells you a little bit more about the continuing care, because there's different types of, so Ashbourne is, like I said, some people are very independent to some people that need a fair amount of help and might have a home care person come in uh, and uh, chat with them two or three times a day. So what Ashbourne does, so if you're living in the community um, in your own home and you want home care, you dial up home care, you, I need someone, you get assessed, they send someone out to maybe help you with a wound dressing or bathing or that kind of stuff. If you're in Ashbourne, what we do is the folks at Ashbourne, about 50, 55 of them in Ashbourne have home care. So we combine the dollars in our, the home care staff are our staff. They're not community staff. So it's a little bit different. So if, the, if you different types of home care, supported living, there's different levels of supported living as well. Um, so we, it can go anywhere from being a locked unit if someone has dementia and they, they wander to, we have supported living here. What supported living means is we have access to a, nurse at night, um, we have health care aides in the building, we have um, food service, so we have a full kitchen, those kind of things. So there's really, there's a spectrum of services. And so really, if you're looking for something, the best thing to do is check out this website. That's the care model. That's not the facility model. So Ashbourne is not Alberta Health Services, but this tells you where the levels of care are. And so you're informed going into a building saying, so what, what level of care do you have in this building? Some have a variety, anything from independent to long-term care. Um, some have none. Some have home care where the home care workers come in from the community and provide the home care. So these are sort of important questions to ask along with the, the questions that we talked about before. Um, but like I say, not all of seniors residents are created equal not all of them are welcoming and inclusive but my hope is that there's more and more out there every day and uh so anyways and if i think that's about all i need to say for now if people would like to ask questions um more specific questions i'd be happy to answer them that's great. If you could raise your, uh, put your little yellow hands up or write something in the chat or raise your hands and we'll uh, take you in a hopefully efficient order. I see Eric has a question. Please go ahead. Hi, two things really briefly. One is thank you, Laurie, for putting bullying front and center. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of work that I've done in the seniors community, people seem to think that bullying is uh, a school or a playground issue and it's not it's a lifetime occupation so facing bullying is really good the second you mentioned about talking to staff expecting re uh reluctance uh my feeling and i know larry and uh sydney the others would say anytime we've gone out what we have met is not a resistance what we've met is curiosity people yeah. are just curious they just want to know so thanks very much laurie that's uh, all i wanted to say I just, I would just add to that, Eric, that bullying is not always very overt. So we also have to be very um, observant of less overt types of bullying. And so we, we try to be a, to that, not just, you know, why are you wearing, why, why are you wearing a, a, a pink dress and, and you're a man? That's not, that's pretty darn overt, but some of them can be more subtle than that. And so we have to really be on top of it. Like I said, it's not, uh, we're never done. We're never done. We have to just keep, it's keep going. Yeah. 
Um, uh, Michael, I see you have a question. Please proceed. I do. I do. Uh, thank you. And, and uh, thanks very much, uh, Lori. Um, I appreciate very much. I have kind of um, uh, two questions that are somewhat similar. Um, so you have um, uh, people who um, come in that, as you said, walk, the drive, the blah, blah, blah. Um, uh, what happens as they perhaps are aging and aren't able to do those things? Mm -hmm. and, and if they happen to be a couple where one is doing, like you say, well, and the other um, it, it is not doing very well. And, and, and that, how, how do you see that and what do you do? Okay, so that is, that's, that's an awesome question because what happens is, let's say someone moves into our building and they're very uh, independent. They just don't wanna look after their house anymore, or a big yard or, you know, it's too much to look after. So people always say, you know, I, I don't wanna move into a place because it reduces my independence. It actually does the opposite. It gives you more freedom because you don't have to worry about those things. You can do more of the things that you like and less of the things you don't like. So you get to be a bit more independent. So let's say, Michael, I'm gonna pick on you. Let's say you're here, you've been living here for two or three years, you have a fall and you break your hip. And so now you require more assistance. What we do is we contact Alberta Health Services. We have case managers that are connected to our building and come in and, and meet with people quite often. They'll come in and do an assessment for you and they'll, they'll chat with you. And this could include a physical assessment or a cognitive assessment because people's cognition can change over time as well. And uh, contrary to popular opinion, there are things they can do to slow down dementias and so forth. But anyway, so they come in and then what they do is they, they meet with the resident and the family and say, okay, this is, it's almost like a prescription for your care. So Michael, you're not gonna be able to bathe yourself today or for maybe the next three months because you broke your hip. So we'll send someone in in the morning to help you get dressed. We'll send someone in at lunchtime to uh, give you your medications and then at nighttime to come and help you get into your pajamas and get into bed. So they actually give a prescription for your care. And so that can change over time. Now there is a maximum amount of hours you can get, but that is sort of the beauty of being in a community where I will take Michael's dollars and I'll take Jan's dollars and I will take Eric's dollars, the home care dollars, we'll put it together and we hire staff. So rather than you just get this. So some days, Jan, your needs are higher than Michael's and vice versa. So we're able to just move our staff around the building based on need. We're still fulfilling the Alberta Health Services um, designation or the things that they prescribe for you, but we're able to be a bit more flexible around time and, and what you want. And actually, if you do the math at the end of the day, some of the folks rent actually helps augment the, the care staff that is here. Because we've got a little bit more than you would get if you just went dollar for dollar. And so that that's the piece about how your if your care changes. So that would be tailored to what you needed. And if you're a couple, this has been, and I, and I apologize if anybody's a great fan of Alberta healthcare system right now, you should tune out because I might say a bad word. <laughs> because I think it's a bit broken when it comes to couples. The, the, if one person's cognitive or physical abilities change that they require a higher level of care, often they'll split them up. And I have been, I have gone to bat for a number of families and, and been quite successful where people have been married for 50, 60, 65 years, and they want to send one of them to long-term care because their care needs have changed. So what it means for places like Ashbourne and um, the care staff is we go to bat for them and we will argue with upper health services and make sure. So our, our question to them, so quite often the, the knee-jerk reaction from the medical community is off they go to long-term care. And mine is, is, okay, let's take a look at that person and see what we have that we can do to keep them together. And it might not even be a couple. It might be somebody that's lived in this building for 20 years and doesn't want to go. So we, that has their home set up, they're, you know, they're, they're, it's their home. This is their home. It's not a hospital. It's not, you know, it's not a, a, a place, a stopover before you go to the next place. 
this is people's home. So when they want to split them up, we, we advocate with the individual to get more services in place. Now, what Alberta House Services doesn't do is pull in, they see this person as a diagnosis. We see the person as a whole being that has family. They maybe have monetary resources. They maybe have friends. We can maybe bring in volunteers so that we can augment their care in a way that allows them to stay together longer. So over the course of my work here at Ashbourne, uh, we've done that several times uh, where we've had to try and keep people here who don't want to go. Now, someone wants to go or their family says they must go. Absolutely. But if you want to stay, we'll support you to stay. And we actually have a protocol written out to say, can we, and it's a process, and I won't share with you, can we meet your needs? And so it's a process that we look at and we look at the person's other supports. Quite often people in here only get so much home care, but they are augmented with either paid, paid care, which we can do, or family members. For example, doing the laundry or you know, taking them out grocery shopping or helping them order. We do Instacart, all sorts of stuff. So I think it's a difficult question. And I think it's about a broken system right now in terms of how we house our, our elders when their health starts to fail. So yeah, that's, that's my, again, my soapbox. I think that we, we do a disservice to some of our seniors when, and, and couples is horrible when we've had to separate people because the, there aren't the facilities. If one person goes to long-term care, unless you're willing to pay about $7,000 a month, you cannot live in the same place. And that's not an exaggeration. So does that answer your question, Michael? Yeah. That you. just gets my blood pressure up. So, so I apologize for that. <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> thank, thank you, Michael. Uh, we have a, a series of questions from Joan in the chat. Um, and I see Blair has a question. So we'll take you next, Blair. Uh, so Joan's asking, um, do you have staff there 24 seven? Do you have temporary accommodations for guests? And do you have any type of security in place? Yes, yes, and yes. <laughs> <laughs> so we just recently opened up and, and we, we realized there was a need in the community to do uh, guest suites. And so, so we currently have three guest suites. And what that is, so we, we use it for a random uh, sort of number of things. So the guest suite can be used for someone who's visiting with a resident. Uh, and so, or the guest suite can, can, suite can be, so Michael, his partner is driving him crazy, takes a lot of work, so Michael needs a break. So we might take Michael's partner and he could stay here, it's respite care, basically. This, the third kind of folks that we have coming through here are, right now we have a lady in the building whose daughter is at the university hospital. Um, and received at her second transplant. And so it's a long hospital stay. So mom is there from out of town. So we will often have folks in here. We had um, um, uh, some people from the Hutterite community in Saskatchewan where their, one of their family members was having surgery. So we use those suites, they're fully decorated suites. And that, so the answer to that is yes. So security, we have the same security you would have in most buildings. We've got a, we've got actually a fair amount of cameras. We have a buzzer system. Um, our front doors lock at eight o'clock at night. So people have to have a fob to get in. You have to get a fob to get in or a reception. When a receptionist is there, the reception will let you in. Um, that receptionist currently works from nine to nine. And so they let them in. If it's after nine o'clock, the resident has to let the person in. I'm sorry, is that all the questions? Did I catch them? They catch some, Joan? All right. Thanks, Joan. We've also just added a taxi. What we found out, one of the things that was really hard for people was a taxi service. So we have a bus, but we also have a taxi with a driver that takes people to their medical appointments. And the reason we put that in place is that often people were just dropped at the doorstop, at the doorstep and had difficulty getting from there to finding their, what office they need to be in the K clinic. So our driver kind of will, take people right to their to the reception desk for their appointment. So we put that in last summer and it's it's really popular. So you, people just go down and they book it and say, I'd like to go to my doctor's appointment or go for an x-ray here. And then our staff takes them rather than waiting for a taxi. And my mom and 
stepdad have stopped driving. And so now they're really struggling with taxis because they often just drop them at the curb and it's been so damn icy. They can't, they're terrified to get to their house. But anyways, that's one. I think you need a minivan to take the residents to the Legion. Well, we can take them in our bus. We have an accessible bus. So if people can't get upstairs. We, we, we have a 13 passenger bus. And so we take, so we go, we go to Bonnie Dune, we go shopping, we go to Walmart, like we, or we go, we have a, something called a Sunday drive in the summer where they just go out and drive in the country and get an ice cream or stop at a tea shop and get, so we, we do a bunch of stuff. We've got a very, pretty active recreation department. Yeah. Excellent. Blair, would you like to go ahead with your question or comments? Sure, uh, Larry, um, Laurie, just another question on bullying. Uh, a couple of years ago, uh, Michael and Eric and I did a presentation at a senior's residence in the West End. And um, one thing that struck me was some, some of the uh, residents that attended the talk were in tears, actually. They were sobbing in front mm -hmm. of us about the bullying that they were experiencing. Uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't because of LGBTQ issues, yeah. though they thought that that would be even worse. <clears throat> and when I talked to the uh, social director for the building, she was in charge of, I think, five other <clears throat> five other buildings, excuse me. And she said, um, kind of bizarre in a way, because I said, you have an issue here. And she said, well, we have it in five other buildings. And I said, well, what are you going to do about this? And um, she didn't seem to have an answer. So I was just wondering how, and I know bullying is a behavior that's very difficult to change. So number one, our residents, do they feel okay to tell you that they're being bullied and when you and, and when there is a certain person doing this behavior i know you said you have some uh, um, documents and everything about this but how do you deal with it and stop it because it was devastating for these residents and you're absolutely right and it comes in all different kinds of forms so i i think it's a three-prong uh, approach that we take so one is uh, the staff is all trained to report that, right? If they see it. So we have, we have a dining room on every floor. So interesting enough, a lot of the conflict happens around mealtime because that's when people come together and you'll have one resident making a comment about the other. So the staff will report it to us. Residents report it to us. They, they feel quite comfortable coming to mine or Sherry's office and just saying, well, do you know what happened at supper time yesterday? And so you might, the person that's being bullied may not be the person that reports. It could be a, a witness. So we do have that. We have lots of sort of discreet ways that people can come talk to us without them knowing. So the other piece that we try to do to kind of assist with that is our recreation uh, coordinator is really awesome at doing information sessions. So information sessions about um, dementia, information sessions about, so there might be films or guest speakers or someone come in that talks to our residents about what this is about. So understanding if you see this happening, um, this is why and how you respond to it, right? So again, now, like I said before, you can't always change people's values or, or their, their thinking. So for example, if someone doesn't like short brown haired women and is bullying them, I may not ever be able to change that. But as an executive director, under, under this roof of Ashbourne, I would start a process of, it would be like a, um, similar to a disciplinary action that you would have with an employee. It would work the same way or a family member. We don't have the same kind of thing with family members, but they don't tend to um, socialize as much with the, the residents and hasn't been a problem yet. So let's say I'm bullying you, Blair. I would, it would start with a conversation with one of the leadership staff, myself, or um, one of my managers would go and say, what's going on? You know, we heard this, you know, pl please don't do that. Um, if, if it, uh, continues then we might and we have done a written letter saying you must not um, behave like this anymore in the building you know please stop cease and desist the other thing is we can request that people we can ask them not to come to the dining room if that's the place that it's happening which is unfortunately almost 
more, more often than not, one of the busier places. Again, interaction, food is a big deal. They might be off doing their own thing all day, but they're brought together. And so we might ask them not to eat in the dining room. We will deliver your meals to your suite and you can eat in your suite rather than be a bully. And in the extreme case, and I have to say I've only had one, we actually evicted a person because they refused to stop. And so we did give them notice and evict them. And so we, we take it pretty seriously. We try to sort of head it off at the past with some education. And, um, but yeah, I think that's kind of how we handle it, Blair. Does that answer your question okay? Yeah. And I'll just double check with Sydney. Your question was similar that you wrote in the chat. You said, bullies can be sneaky. How do you deal with this? Did you have a follow-up there with Lori? I do. Um, in my experience um, in the sort of continuing care situation, um, um, my mom was being hit in the elevator when no one else was there. So this bully didn't bully in the dining room and she didn't bully uh, when anyone else was witness or staff was in the elevator, but she would you know, give her a really hard hit in the ribs, uh, either with her cane or her elbow when they were alone in the elevator. And this woman was on the same floor as mom. Mm. And, you know, we did report it, but because um, there was no camera in the elevator and no witnesses, it took the better part of a year before it was dealt with. And I, I just wonder how you deal with that sneaky part of bullying, because, um, you know, bullying when everybody's around in the playground, bullies get better and better in that. By the time they're 75, they're expert. Mm -hmm. But it's the sneakiness of it that um, I think does the lasting damage. And I, I just wondered if you had comments on that, Lori. Mm -hmm. So I, I guess that is a difficult situation. I'll give you um, an <laughs> actual thing that happened because elevators, are a funny place. So we had uh, um, a woman inappropriately touching a, a, a man in the elevator. And so we, we know our residents quite well, right? Because we're, we're pretty small. We, we only have 107 suites. And so we don't have, we're not like a 600 person building. So we know our residents pretty well. And so we tend to know, I mean, if they're new, it's a little harder. I would, in that case, I would, I would tend to believe your mom and then go have a conversation with the, the person that she claims did this. Does this person have a history of doing this previously? Has anybody else reported it? I mean, there's a lot in there. So the conversation would be with both of them. Um, about what happened. Can you tell me what happened? And if it's going on for a long time, I think we'd need to take things to the next level. Sometimes if, um, do, it depends on what's the reason for the bullying. Is there, a, is there a mental health issue? Is there a dementia issue? What's happening there with that person? And then you might need to involve the care staff and the family to see what else we could do. But yeah, we have moved people to a different floor uh, to a different suite because the person, and, and sometimes it's just a personality conflict. It's not even about bullying. It's just neighbors getting, uh, getting at each other or same thing sitting in a, at the dining room table. You have an assigned seating at a dining room table with two or three other people. If that's not working out, then we will switch tables or you, or somebody might go eat on a different floor. Uh, so there's, there's other options. It's really, you just have to, each one is individual. If it's very overt, would I say that we would see all of them? It's, it's really a tough one. It's really a tough one. Well, thank you, Lori, for such an inspiring and important talk. Uh, that time just flew by. We obviously need more. We just don't have it today. Thank you for all of you for coming. Um, I would hope that we can see you all next week when our speakers will be Joan Whitecap and Christy Harcourt who will talk to us about hosting the CJSR Daywire show. Uh, please take a moment, fill out the survey that we will send to you in the near future. If you need to contact us, you can contact us at Aging with Pride at Pride Center of Edmonton.ca. And now I return you to, to our host to close this meeting.
that. So, but just just a quick dad. Just uh, if you want to get hold of me, go through uh, Aging with Pride, and they can put you in contact if you've got questions that aren't answered. Thank you, Lori. Bye, everyone.